This is Psalm 99. Lord is king, let the peoples tremble. He sits enthroned upon the cherubim. Let the earth quake. The Lord is great in Zion. He is exalted over all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome name. Holy is he, mighty king, lover of justice. You have established equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Extol the Lord our God. Worship at his footstool. Holy is he. Moses and Aaron were among his priests. Samuel was also among those who called on his name. They cried to the Lord, and he answered them. He spoke to them in a pillar of cloud. They kept his decrees and the statutes that he gave them. O Lord our God, you, you answered them. You are a forgiving God to them, but an avenger of their wrongdoings. Extol the Lord our God and worship at his holy mountain, for the Lord our God is holy. <laughs> The word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. <laughs> Thank you, Lexi. We we'll go right into our gospel reading. Chapter, Luke chapter 9, verses 28 through 36, which is, of course, the story of the transfiguration. But that reading that uh, Lexi just gave us from the psalm will actually be more the basis of our preaching this morning. Luke chapter 9, verses 28 through 36. Now about eight days after these sayings, Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish. At Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep, but since they had stayed awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Just as they were leaving him, Peter said to, him, to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent, and in those days, no one told no one any of the things they had seen. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts together be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. There we are. <laughs> I love being on a mountaintop. I prefer it when I can either drive or take uh, the ski lift or a, a gondola of some kind. But I love being on the top of a mountain, especially on a clear day. There's something about being on a mountaintop that can help you gain perspective on life. And depending on how high the mountain is, you may come down from the mountaintop a changed person. A few years ago, I drove to the top of Bear Mountain on a beautiful fall day. Notice I didn't hike, I drove. <laughs> The sky was blue, the air was warm, and the trees were turning gold and the reddish brown as far as the eye could see. How many of you have been to the top of Bear Mountain in New York State there, State Park? The view was spectacular in every direction. The Hudson River winding around West Point to the north and stretching all the way to the skyscrapers of Manhattan to the south. It was a weekday, so it wasn't uh, crowded. I'd been at Stony Point for a Presbytery Committee meeting so I played a little hooky on the way home, and I'm glad I did. Whatever a four-hour meeting had uh, taken out of me, my spiritual tank was refilled by those few moments on the mountaintop. Today is Transfiguration Sunday. It's a day we remember when the disciples were with Jesus on the mountaintop, where he was transfigured into a vision with Moses and Elijah. It is a pivotal moment in Jesus' ministry. For a moment, Jesus was part of the Mount Rushmore, if you will, of 
biblical heroes. Moses, the giver of the law, and Elijah, the greatest of the prophets, and Jesus, the one who fulfilled the law and prophecy. We call it the transfiguration because Jesus' appearance was transfigured, changed before their eyes. Some gospels use the word metamorphosis, which we get as our transfigured to describe what took place. But here in Luke's gospel, what the disciple, it, he uses the, a word that literally means Jesus' face was different when they saw him in that moment. He was changed. The experience had lasted, has had a lasting impact upon the disciples because uh, the story has been told over and over for 2,000 years. They were changed in that moment just as Jesus had been changed. But they were changed in ways that they didn't fully understand at first. They came down from that mountain and then began a journey, a journey to Jerusalem and the momentous final events. We celebrate Transfiguration as we prepare to begin our Lenten journey towards Holy Week and Easter. The psalm that uh, Lexi read for us this morning is meant to be read on Transfiguration Sunday because it too speaks of the mountaintop experience of being in God's presence. The psalm ends with these words, extol the Lord our God and worship on God's holy mountain for the Lord <laughs> is holy. The holiness of God is certainly on display at the Transfiguration and here in the psalm. But the psalm paints a much fuller picture of just who God is. It ends with God's holiness, but it begins with God as a king, an awesome king, so impressive that the people tremble and the earth shakes. The psalmist also wants us to know that, it is a, that God is a king, but a king who loves justice and fairness, a God who forgives and yet holds accountable. Stay a few moments in the presence of this God and you too will tremble and you too will be changed. One of the things you need to do when you get to the mountaintop is stay a few minutes and take in the view, right? With the binoculars or just with your eye. So let's linger for a moment and look in the direction of God's justice and God's forgiveness. The psalm described God as a lover of justice. What a beautiful way to describe God's relationship to justice. We sometimes think of God's judgment or God's justice in harsh terms. We can even imagine an angry, vengeful God ready to smash us if we do the wrong thing. But here we see a God who loves, not demands, loves justice and fairness. But lest we think that is a soft image making God a pushover, later we see that God is an avenger. God wants us to live a certain way and there are consequences when we don't. This view of God's justice has been on my mind a lot over these last few weeks as I've had several experiences lately with our human concept of justice. Two weeks ago, Elizabeth and I were at the United Nations for a forum on prisons and mass incarceration from an international perspective. There were chaplains, prison administrators, academics, and formerly incarcerated folks from the United States, from Sweden, from South Korea, and even Malawi. The view from that meeting was grim. Prison conditions are rough in this country. Try to imagine a prison in Malawi, one of the poorest countries on earth. Men have to sleep with nothing on the floor, but they have to sleep so tight they have to go end to end so there's room. And when one turns over, they all have to turn together. And by the way, we support a Presbyterian missionary, Jeremy Garbot Welch, and his ministry of support to prison chaplains in Malawi and other African countries. And one of the speakers was the former superintendent of Bedford Hills Women's Prison. Her most memorable comment was that there are no good prisons, including the one that she ran for 20 years. Her goal was to do away with prisons and find new ways to achieve justice and fairness in our society. 
There may be no good prisons, but some are better than others. We heard of an interesting experiment in South Korea where the government has contracted with a church to run a prison. What a novel idea. He described the atmosphere of trust and respect as staff, inmates, and volunteers all ate meals and engaged in Bible study together. Also, there was one returned citizen. And by the way, that's a new way of describing people who were formerly incarcerated. That's better than ex-con, don't you think? A returned citizen. This returned citizen is working to change prisons now from the outside as a chaplain. He earned his divinity degree and PhD while he was in Sing Sing Prison. And many of you in this church helped run those programs of education at Sing Sing. The bottom line is we need to change our approach to justice in this country. As we left that meeting, we were changed. We had heard stories and had experiences that changed us. We were inspired by some exciting new ideas and depressed by, by the reality for millions. But you can't reflect on God's justice for long and stay complacent about the way things are. You've heard statistics like the United States has 22% of all the world's prisons. You got that? That of all the prisoners in the world, 22% of them are in our prisons. Well, I heard a new one that is even more shocking. The United States has one third, 33% of all women who are incarcerated around the world. 33%, one in every three is in an American prison. We need to change. We need to transform. We need to be transfigured. We need a new vision, how to do things differently. One group that is doing things differently is our children, the nonprofit organization that supports women inmates and returning citizens here in New York. We heard a presentation from them in, here at PCMK in January. We support their efforts to provide the resources for the Children's Center at Bedford Prison. And many of us host children that this organization brings in from all over the state to visit their mothers in the summer and on school holidays. But I learned they do so much more, especially at their center on, in Long Island City. Well, last Tuesday, I had another mountaintop experience, and it was with the Our Children. They were being honored as a recipient of the Community Service Award from the Mutual of America Foundation. They'd received a large grant. And I was invited to represent the church community in our area to, for our support for our children as they were being recognized for their tireless work to give women a second chance. I call it a mountaintop experience because it was on the 35th floor of Mutual of America's building on Park Avenue. It was a beautiful winter day and the skies were clear and the views were amazing. And as I looked out the window, I could see St. Bartholomew's Church across the street where I served the homeless as part of our midnight run program. Do we still stop at St. Bart's? Sometimes. And from that vista point, I could see God's forgiveness, which is part of the justice that God loves so much. And so that mountaintop experience changed me as well. I came down the elevator more hopeful than I had been on the way up. That was Tuesday. But the good feeling didn't last too long. Wednesday was anything but a mountaintop experience for our nation. For hours, we were dragged into the uglier side of politics as the president's former lawyer told us more than we wanted to hear. If even half of it is true, it painted a very disturbing picture, not just of a man, but of a country and a system that tolerates and even rewards such behavior. The chairman of the committee wrapped up the day with these words, we're better than this. He could have been referring to so many things that are wrong in our country today because we are better than this. We need to change. We can change. On the night before he was killed, Dr. Martin Luther King gave his mountaintop speech in Memphis. He was working towards God's justice, and he said he could see that it was coming. He said, God's allowed me to go up to the mountain, and I've looked over, and I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we, as a people, will get 
to the promised land. And I'm so happy tonight, I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He had been to the mountaintop and he was changed. The disciples were on the mountaintop with Jesus and they were changed. You and I are about to be changed. In a moment, we will gather at, one, at what is one of our mountaintop moments. We will gather at the table to be in the presence of the one whose glory embodies God's justice and God's forgiveness. The one who will show us the way to the promised land of peace and justice for all. So prepare to come to the mountaintop and take in the view. But we can't stay long. There is much to do. We have to change the world one day at a time, one issue at a time, one life at a time, starting here and now with you and with me. Amen.